feel the power of God because I believe there's an invitation for the more. And as I was beginning to minister, I heard the Lord said, now shift to the word because the word has an impartation as well. And I want to steward the word because I felt like the Lord wanted me to preach out of John 11 to you tonight. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John 11. But as you do that, I'm going to tell you a little story. Is that okay? Because I love to share a little bit of my life just so you and I can get to know each other a little bit more. But I was raised in a family of three girls, and I was the youngest of three girls. So what does that make me? The baby. No, I was not spoiled. No, I was not. My sisters might disagree, but I'm like, no, I was not. And so I found myself six years younger than my oldest sister and four years younger than my middle sister. So there was enough of a gap that I watched my two older sisters do the natural maturation of life, right? So I watched them get their first license, their license, their driver license. I watched them get their first job, discover who FICA is and federal taxes, right? I watched them have their first boyfriend. I watched them go to prom. I watched them go away to college. Like I watched them do the often those natural uh, markers and chapter points that we all go through in some way, shape, or form. I just watched them because I was enough younger that I had a front row seat to this. But my oldest sister, Kathleen, she would laugh really hard, and trust me, she would be in the front row laughing hysterically, saying it's absolutely true, so I'm not exaggerating, and I do have her permission to tell this story. So here I am. I am about probably uh, 13 years old at this point. She's 19 years old. She's six years older than me, and her whole desire in her life is to be a wife and a mother. It's an honorable desire. It's a beautiful desire. But we know when you're following Jesus, you don't always have control over that timeline. Can I get an amen? Because I didn't get married till I was 39. So I'm going to say an amen and an amen. You don't have, you can, yes, you can go get married. But if the goal is, mar- if the goal is God's best, it might take a moment, right? So I'm just saying. So she had this desire to get married, and it's beautiful. That's a wonderful desire. But it was her number one focus, right? We all might know someone like that, you might be like that. And that's okay. There's no shame in that. But there's a journey of surrender that is required for you to trust God with the timeline of your life. But she didn't quite have that revelation yet. At 19 years old, she found herself um, kind of at our out our house. My parents are both educators. They're teachers. And so education has massive high value in my family. And so they were like, you need to go to college or you need to get a full-time job, but you have to be productive in society. Like, you could not live in our home without some sort of contribution. Anyone else be raised in that kind of home? Like the whole like you living at the house, not working, not going to school, never going to work out with Tom and Cheryl Pitcairn. Those are my parents. Like ever. Okay. So they were like, you have a choice. She's like, I don't want to get a full-time job yet. They're like, you're going to college. So she, she went to a private university and her whole motivation, and she was honest about it. Her whole motivation of going to college was to get an MRS degree. All right. It was, you know, she ended up majoring in theology and she went into full time ministry and whatnot, but she wasn't there for the education. She was there to find her husband. We went to her college graduation. She was single. I remember her laying on the bed crying like she was so upset, like her graduation day had some grief in it. And as a family, we're like, dear Lord, can you answer our prayers? Because we all know when someone is struggling in your family, the whole family is struggling. And we can't, can I get a double amen on that? Right. And so this went on, I mean, from 16 years old, and all of a sudden she's going through her 20s, and the years are passing, and she is unmarried, and she's single, and she is not happy about it. But my middle sister, who's four years older than me, just 16, 17 months younger than her, goes away to another private Christian college, and within the first three months meets her husband, brings him home for Christmas, meets the family, and by that July they are married. And my oldest sister is watching her younger sister. You know how this is going to go. It's not going to go well. She's watching her younger sister get everything she's been desiring. Anyone relate to that? When you're watching God answer the prayers of someone who didn't even pray it, my middle sister didn't even care. She wasn't even thinking about a husband. She could have cared less. She was actually there for the education right? And, my, and so it was, it was happening to someone who didn't care about it. And so my oldest sister was like, are you kidding me, God? And so the phone calls increased. So I remember, I'm the youngest, so I'm living with my parents. So I am privy to all of the conversations that are happening with my parents and my older sister. And she is crying more. She's more upset. The, the calls are increasing. My poor mother is an amazing intercessor. She's calling us to family fast. And I mean, we're getting thin here, people, because, you know, we, uh, because God hadn't been answered and we're staying in these fasts. We're like, Lord, can you deliver us as a family? 
She ends up having a not great experience in her first ministry experience. My parents say, come home. Let's do a regroup. Let's get kind of refocused and see what God wants to do. She ends up moving back home. By this point, friends, she is in her early 30s. And she is single. She is living at my parents' house. She's working a job she's not passionate about. And I had moved out by that point. Thank you, Jesus. So I wasn't there for that. But when I would call home, I would hear the challenges of the situation. And my dad, he is incredibly gracious, and he always says that women are his ministry because even our pets were female. Like, my dad was surrounded with so much estrogen, and he would always say it takes a special man to raise daughters, right? And he is, a, he is actually an incredibly kind father. And he came to my oldest sister one time because he saw how unhappy she was, and but he also recognized in prayer and in praying for her, he felt like the Lord says it's time for her to get out of the nest and go to the next assignment. Not anything negative other than just a father recognizing she needed to move to the next assignment, right? As a parent, you recognize the season has shifted for you. <laughs> you need to go. So um, so he said, to, he said to her, he said, what is God speaking to you? And she said, you know, I feel like I'm supposed to, because we're from Southern Oregon, and I'm born and raised in a small town in Southern Oregon, and at that time, she felt called to Colorado Springs. And she felt like there was a ministry there that God was calling her to be a part of. But she didn't want to go because she was single. She had told the Lord, I don't want to move somewhere where I don't know anyone. I don't want to move somewhere and live by myself. I don't want to go and have to start over as a single person. And that was her whole thing. That's why she had never told my parents what she had been feeling for the past couple of months. But my father, being a man of discernment and prayer, he knew God had been speaking to her. And in fact, the Lord had. So my dad, remember, being an incredibly kind father, he says to my sister, I'll go with you. Let's just go check it out. Let's just see what God says about it. I'm going to book us two tickets. We're going to go to Colorado Springs. And there was a specific ministry she was feeling a draw toward. So he says, hey, no, you don't have to do this, but let's just go see what God's saying. Let's get to the church. So they fly out there. And my sister, even on the flight, is crying. Even on the flight, she's like upset. Because she feels the wrestle. She feels the disappointment of where she's at in her life. We can all relate to that. When you find yourself in a place you don't want to be, when you find yourself in a situation you're like, God, I, I told you I didn't want to look like this, and it looks like this. And God's like, I'm at work. But it doesn't feel like he's at work. She's on the flight, and she's crying. She gets to the hotel room, and they're getting ready to go to the service. And even on the way to the service, my dad has said, she was like, I just... Even if God tells me, I, I not, and my sister is like, loves Jesus. And she's like, I don't even know if I have the courage to do this if God actually asked me to do this because it feels so risky. It feels so vulnerable if, if God even tells me to do it. So she didn't even really want to go to the service because she didn't even want to hear God tell her to do it. Anyone relate to that? It's like you're trying to even avoid uh, the leading of the Lord. But my dad, again, being patient, kind, and wise, what did he do? He said, we're going to go and we're just going to listen to what God's saying. So they get there and there's this young guy that is leading worship from the keyboard. And my sister looks at him and they look at each other and they kind of smile. And she looks at my dad and she goes, I think I went to college with him. And, and the, she went to college in North Dakota in this really small private Christian university. So they're in Colorado Springs. And she's like, I think I know him from, like, North Dakota days. And so my dad goes, oh, that's interesting. At the break, you know, there's always a natural transition between the worship and the word. And they say, hey, say hi to your neighbor. He, like, comes flying off the platform. He's like, Kathleen, what are you doing here? She's like, oh, my gosh. I, I, I thought it was you. What are you doing here? He goes, I've lived here for two years. I'm on the worship team here. God told me to move here. He also is from Oregon, and he was born and raised only 45 minutes from our hometown. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break something down for you. I want to tell you the other side of a story. Because you and I know when a God story is being written, there are multiple sides to the story. So I just told you my older sister's version of the story, right? So now I'm going to tell you the guy's side of the story. His name is Dan. The side of Dan's story is he saw this girl named Kathleen at his university, and he liked her. He was like, I like that girl. I'd like to get to know that girl. But tragedy struck his family. His dad passed away suddenly. Uh, his family is a family, unfortunately, of, 
has poverty and just did not have the means to be able to cover the bills. Him being one of the eldest sons, he quit college, went home, and got a full-time job to take care of his family and his siblings and his mother. And so he left North Dakota, went back to Oregon, and he got hired as a worship pastor at a church because he's incredibly anointed at leading worship. And God moved. The revival broke out. But he kept thinking about this girl, Kathleen. He kept thinking about this girl from college. And then he heard that she moved back home to be with her parents. It was only 45 minutes south. And he was finally getting the guts and feeling led by the Lord, like, maybe I can pursue her. But as soon as he got the guts to, like, you know, cold call her and ask her out and see if she'd make the 45-minute drive, or excuse me, if he could make the 45-minute drive and, like, take her out and whatnot, God calls him to Colorado Springs. And the Lord says, I'm calling you to be a part of the worship ministry at this church. He says, but the Lord, I didn't get a pursuer at college, and now she's living only 45 minutes south of me. I want a pursuer. And the Lord says, son, be about my business, and I'll be about yours. And so out of obedience, he moves to Colorado Springs, and he feels like he has to lay that down. And so two years later, someone say two years later, He's been thinking about this girl, Kathleen, but he's just assumed she's gotten married, she's moved on, until one day he looks up at worship, and she's there in the fifth row on the left-hand side of the sanctuary with her dad. And he's wondering, what in the world, why are you here? When there's the moment to say, you can say hi to your neighbor, he dashes off the platform. He's like, what are you doing here? She goes, well, I possibly feel called by God, and my dad and I came to check it out. He goes, have you found an apartment? Do you need a job? I know where there's an apartment. I, I know where there's some, I, I possibly know where there's some jobs. And he's like, she's like, oh, that's amazing. He says, um, what hotel are you staying at, they say, where they're staying? He says, I'll be there at 2 o'clock. I'll pick you up. We'll go to lunch, and I'll show you around. And he becomes like the host. There's the other side of the story. But see, my sister doesn't know the other side of the story. So she's still in her side of the story. So they go back to the hotel room, true story, and they go back up to the hotel room. And again, my dad, and we laugh about the story because she laid on the bed in the hotel room bawling. And my dad goes, why are you crying? What's up? What's, what are you so upset about? And she goes, God told me to come here, and I feel like it's a yes, and I don't want to do it because all I want to do is meet my husband and get married. <laughs> At the exact moment as she's saying, all I want to do is meet my husband and get, mar- get married, it's 2 o'clock, and there's a phone call from the lobby of the hotel, and Dan says, I'm here to take you to see Colorado Springs. As you know, that was my brother-in-law. Okay, okay, that was my brother-in-law, Dan, and we laugh to this day that she was bawling and crying on the bed when God was trying to answer her prayer. Some of us are weeping because we only see our side of the story. I'm here tonight to tell you there's another side to your story. There's the God side to your story. Don't forget, God is writing a bigger story than what you see. And I came here tonight to Grace Assembly to Bakersfield, California to declare a prophetic statement that I heard over you and the Lord told me to tell you and prophesy over you, it's not over. I want to declare over you, it's not over. The story isn't finished. There's another side to the story. Insert John 11. Come on, let's read some powerful scripture tonight. It says, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Someone say two days. Let's skip ahead to verse 17. It says, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Someone say four days. 
Verse 19 says, Many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha in their loss, and when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. But Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, Your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Verse 27, yes, Lord, she told him, I've always believed you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who came into the world from God. And then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher's here and wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to Jesus. Verse 32, stick with me. It's a power punch portion of scripture. We got to get the full essence. I'm giving you the ESP and real right here. It says, when Mary arrived, and saw Jesus, <clears throat> she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw Mary weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put Lazarus? He asked them. And they told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus shouted, verse 43, Lazarus, come out. See, he had to clarify because they all would have come out. So he just said, Lazarus, you come out. Verse 44, last verse, and the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth, and Jesus told him, unwrap him and let him go. Come on, friends. I want to tell you, I want to prophesy over you, I want to declare over you tonight, it may look like it's been over, but it's not over because God is writing a new story and God is doing a new thing. I heard over Grace Assembly Church that delay is not denial. Come on, somebody. Delay is not denial. You know, when Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, he was a two-day pilgrimage away from the scene. They expected him to come running. They expected him to drop everything and get to the scene of the crisis. But Jesus did something unusual, something unprecedented, something unexpected. I want you to catch those words because I want you to understand God is doing something he's never done before. And I want you to understand understand that Jesus waited two days, but it was not a denial. It was a delay. And some of us, because delays have looked like one year, two years, three years, one decade, two decades, we're like, it's a denial. I want to declare truth over you that the timing of the Lord, I don't always understand the delays of the Lord, but I do trust the timing of the Lord. And the delays of the Lord are not the denial of the Lord. I believe in a season of waiting, like these women, Mary and Martha, are in the waiting. They are in this place of the unknown. They are in the place of crisis. They are in the place of tragedy. And it is in those places where we must trust God in unmet expectation. Many of us have unmet expectations. We thought God was going to, should have coulda, woulda, done it a variety of ways, and yet we find ourselves in the place of contradiction of what we thought it would look like. Anyone relate to that in this room? I'm raising my hand with you. But what I love about Jesus is he understood why, because he stood on the report of the Father, not the report of the messenger. Many messages are going to come our way, but we choose which one we actually agree with. And the message you and I agree with actually dictates our posture and our response to the crisis. So when Jesus got the emergency news that Lazarus was on his deathbed, Lazarus was sick, he did something unexpected, unprecedented, and he waited. If you do not know the character of Jesus, when you are waiting, you can misinterpret his intention. How many times in the waiting when Jesus isn't moving or showing up or coming through in a way we thought he should have, would have, we find ourselves questioning the character of God. 
I've been there. Probably everyone in this room has been there. But what I love about this portion of scripture, it models to us through Jesus. It models to us because he stood on the report of the Father. He was not stressed out. He didn't go into crisis mode. He didn't get all worried and anxiety ridden. He wasn't, uh, in a sense, uh, taken hostage from the assignment he was supposed to be focused on. He wasn't distracted from where he was supposed to be because he heard the Father say, this is actually for my glory, and if you go too soon, I won't get the glory. If you go ahead of God's timing, the full timing, excuse me, the full glory of God doesn't get released. See, sometimes delays are that there's a greater testimony that happens. There's a greater outpouring that takes place. There's a greater story of impartation that happens when we actually stand on the report of the Lord and not the messenger of the crisis. See, I don't know about you, I love to take things to modern day, right? Because I like to bring them like, how would I react? And I just imagine if I was blessed enough to be one of the 12 of Jesus' disciples, you know, I don't know if you would know this about me. Some of you are like, duh, we can totally tell. Some of you, maybe not, I don't know. I'm a bit of a take charge kind of a personality. And so, uh, you know, I would probably, wa- he, you know, we would be witnessing Jesus receiving the news from the messenger that there's a crisis and one of his best friends, Lazarus, is fighting for his life. And I would watch Jesus be all calm and just like, okay, we're just going to. And he's not packing his bags. He's not putting gas in the car. He's not getting all the 12 disciples ready to go. And I would observe this. I'm just going to be honest. And I'd be like, did he not? Did he not get the message? Right. Does he not understand the severity of the situation? Like, did that bypass him? Was he just focused on what the father saying but missed the rest of the equation? Like, what's going on there? And if a couple more hours passed, I know me, and I would lovingly and but assertively uh, walk up to Jesus and be like, do you need me to administrate uh, the gathering of the disciples? I can go to the gas station. We'll get gassed up. We'll be ready in a 15 minutes flat. We're in the car. Let's go. You know, I, that would be 100% me. He's like, Krista, that's not what the Father said. We're going to wait here. And I would trust Jesus, but don't think that if we weren't packing our bags by the next morning, I would not again be going to Jesus. Anyone? Really, is there any else? Uh, thank you. I'm not the only one. Just check in. Jesus, um, are you ready to go yet? Again, I am willing to pull the team together. We can make 15 minutes flat. We're out of here. And Jesus is like, it's not time. And if I had not spent time in his presence, if I had not been sitting in his teachings, if I had not witnessed the miracles, how easily I would be offended at his delay. The only way you and I are able to stay unoffended in the delays of the Lord is when we sit in his presence, when we get in his word, when we hear his voice, when we reconnect his heart with our heart, we allow our minds to be renewed, and we don't misconstrue, misconstrue what we don't understand, and we misinterpret the intention of a good father, that he's writing a part of the story that I may not understand and I do not see, but if I know he's the author of my life and he's a good, good father, then I can trust even when I don't understand, and it keeps my heart sweet in the spirit and connected with who he is. It's what guards me against offense in the delays in my life, and I have had some delays in my life. I'm not bringing this word because things have come easy. I'm bringing this word because I know what it's like to send a message to Jesus and put on the funeral, and he doesn't feel like he's there. To receive the casseroles at the door. And I'm like, where's Jesus? I'm not bringing this word from lack of experience. I'm bringing this word because I believe it's what changes us as disciples of Jesus. That in a world that is so easily offended by delays because we have a consumer mentality when it comes to everything. And we take that into our relationship with Jesus. But friends, it doesn't work that way. 
we have a father that actually has a higher call he's bringing us into. He's not the God of immediate gratification. He's the God that is writing a story of redemption and restoration. That there's a story, there's a breakthrough for everyone in the story, not just Mary and Martha. There was an invitation for the encounter for a whole city to witness a miracle. But imagine being Mary and Martha. You sent word. The messengers come back. And Jesus isn't with him. And you would say, did you tell him it was Lazarus? Yes, ma'am, I told him it was Lazarus. Did he understand that he's on his deathbed? Ma'am, I said it twice. I made sure, and he nodded, and he smiled. He smiled? He was at peace. He didn't go pack his bags? He didn't look like he was coming? No, ma'am. I left. I even turned around, and I looked. He wasn't anywhere in sight. I don't understand, says Martha. She tells Mary, and Mary has all the same questions, all the same confusion. What do you do when you're planning the funeral for your brother who died? But you sent word to Jesus two days ago, and if he would have responded when he got the word two days ago, he would still be alive. What do you do in the waiting for the miracle? Friends, it is in the waiting that is actually the richest place you can access in God. It is in the place of suffering that I have experienced the deepest places of his presence. But it's also in the breakthrough. I have experienced the deepest places of his presence. But do not deny the power of the purpose of trusting in the waiting. Mary and Martha are receiving casseroles from everyone. The mourners have taken over their house. They're making funeral plans that they never expected to make. They really thought Jesus was going to show up. And they thought this because they had seen it before. There was a reference point. There was a precedent that had already been set that Jesus healed the sick. They had seen it. They knew it was possible. They knew Jesus wanted to do it. They knew it was who he was. They knew it was a part of his character. So when they set the message, they all had faith, and I want you to catch this, they all had hope as long as Lazarus had breath in his body because it's what they had seen before. As long as Lazarus was breathing, they all had faith for healing. But when the breath left Lazarus' body, everyone's faith left too. Because they did not understand. God the Father didn't want to repeat what he had already done. He wasn't trying to do another healing. He was going to do resurrection power. And Jesus didn't come two days earlier because he knew Lazarus wasn't dead. And he wasn't going to show up to a funeral that was never supposed to take place. So some of us have been wondering why Jesus isn't at the funeral with you. It's because there's not going to be a funeral. And Jesus isn't going to show up to something you're not called to mourn. So wait, we're supposed to get our praise on when things look dead? Yes. You're supposed to kick the mourners out of your house? Yes. You're supposed to take off the grieving clothes because you know God's writing another story? Yes. 
the power of understanding there is another side to your story. Every single thing you have gone through that looks like it's dead. I feel the Lord wanted me to prophesy it's just sleeping. It's not dead. I break off the mindset that it's dead. I break off the mindset that when a certain condition or a thing happened, I don't know how to quite articulate it, but there was like a line for you where your faith began and your faith ended. And when the situation crossed that line, it's like you let the dream go. And I feel like the Lord says, remove a line that I didn't create. Because I'm not trying to do or have you believe what you know I can do. I want to do something you don't even know that's on the menu. They didn't even know resurrection power was available because they had never seen it. They only had faith for healing. They only had faith for while someone was alive. They did not have a reference point that if someone was embalmed, if someone went through the full funeral procession, that someone was actually put in a grave and wrapped in grave clothes, it still wasn't over. They literally thought the story was concluded, and God is saying over us tonight. He's saying over this church. He's saying over this city. He's saying over your personal life. It's not over. It doesn't matter if there has already been a funeral. I want you to recognize I am a God of resurrection power. And someone needs to hear that over your prodigal son and daughter. And someone needs to hear that over your marriage right now. Someone needs to hear we serve a God of resurrection power. What I love about God, because remember, the Father spoke to Jesus and said, this has happened for my glory. So he gets the word and he's, a, you know, gets the word and he's a two-day journey away from Lazarus. He needed to get there. And the truth is, had he already been in motion when we received the word, Lazarus would have died prior to him getting there. But not only did he not do that, he waited an additional two days. So by the time he actually showed up in town, he was four days dead. Why is that so important? Because God wanted no intercessor to get the credit, no medical team to get the credit, no pastor to get the credit, no healing minister to get the credit. No one was going to get the credit from someone who'd been embalmed. No one was going to get the credit from someone who'd been wrapped in the grave and put in the grave and was literally dead for four days. No one's going to get the credit. Who's going to get the credit? God. He's going to get the full measure. No one could take it. And what I love is God's like, I'm not going to share my glory with anyone. I'm going to make sure every single mourner that has been wailing for the last four days knows it was me, has no question on my authority, has no question anymore on my character. Everything began to shift for the entire town. Why? Because the entire town had been grieving. So when someone gets resurrected, it not only is for Lazarus, it's not only for Mary and Martha. It's for the whole city. I want to prophesy over you, Grace Assembly, that everything you have battled for is for more than just you. Everything that you have persevered through is more than just you. It's called to impact a city. We serve a God who's a four-day dead God. What does that mean? Nothing's too dead for God. It hasn't been too long. It hasn't, you know, taken, it hasn't taken too long. The timeline's not off. No, no. We serve a four-day dead God. It doesn't matter how <laughs> difficult your marriage has been for the last 14 years. That's for someone in the room. Guess what? There's resurrection power in the room. One encounter with Jesus, and everything changes. As powerful as the story of Lazarus getting raised, and that's a powerful story. 
When I'm studying out this portion of scripture, I ask questions. I don't know about you. Do you do that when you read the word? I just start asking questions. I said, Lord, I noticed in John 11 that Mary and Martha had the exact same conversation. So I begin to go to commentaries, and I begin to study it out. Because sometimes we understand that different words are used, so they mean different things. And sometimes they can access different things from the Lord. That's not the case here. It's the same conversation. It's the same words. There's no difference between Mary and Martha's conversation. But one got a lecture, Martha, and one got Lazarus, resurrection power. Why did one sister get a lecture and one sister get her brother back? Why? And then the Lord led me to the answer. And the answer we find is in Luke 10. And I said everything I said tonight to get here. In Luke 10, we discover Jesus is in town for the first time, and he's looking for a place to teach and minister. And who opens up her home? Martha and Mary. Martha opens up her home for Jesus to come and minister. Friends, do you think there's any coincidences in the kingdom of God? No. Bill Johnson says this, and I love this. He says, coincidences are the language of heaven. I love that. It is no coincidence that Jesus came out of all the houses to Mary and Martha's house. Why? Because he knew the storm that was going to happen in John 11. So he came, because Luke 10 happened before John 11, chronologically. And so we have to understand, Jesus shows up in the home, knowing ahead what the future has in store for them. Knows the storm that's about to hit the family, but he knows there's an impartation he needs to release for them to be able to walk through the storm. So he comes to their house to teach and to impart. But an important thing happens in the time of impartation. Here's what we begin to read. Luke 10, verse 38, this is what happened. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening. Someone say listening to what Jesus said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. That's never a good thing when the Lord says your name twice. I'm just going to be honest with you. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and you're upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Here's what is modeled to us in Scripture. It's one thing to welcome Jesus into your house. It's another thing to welcome what he came to do. See, you and I can be in the same room with Jesus, but have no room for what he wants to do. Martha was torn between custom and tradition versus encountering Jesus. And Martha was hosting a program where she could have been hosting his presence. And Mary chose listening to the Messiah versus laboring over a menu. And what does Jesus say about Mary? She chose what was greater. Now, the word listening, I had you repeat that word, right? When you study that out in the commentaries, in the original, it means to give rapt attention, full attention, but here's what's powerful. The word listening actually means to absorb. So imagine, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus in Luke 10, and she is absorbing his teaching on resurrection power. How do we know he's talking about that? Because he gave a lecture to Martha that he's resurrection power. Why is that key? Because in John 11, Jesus is having to give a Cliff Notes version of what he already imparted, but because she was distracted, she missed the impartation. Jesus knew they needed the teaching of resurrection power because he knew John 11 was around the corner. One received it, one was distracted. So when the crisis came, what did Martha do? I just imagine her with a hand on her hip, and she says she walks up to Jesus. She says, had you been here, she's full of grief. She's full of confusion. She's full of anger. I get it. 
She walks to Jesus and says, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, am I not the resurrection power? Am I not resurrection life? Do you not believe that, Martha, for if anyone dies, they actually, if they believe in me, they never, ever die. He's giving her a theological lesson, but she doesn't get it. What does she say? She goes, yeah, yeah, I believe that when, you know, uh, everyone's going to get raised up at the end. I believe that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. She's not getting it. She has totally missed the impartation. He's trying to, in his kindness, in his mercy, trying to impart into her in the crisis. But she's so blocked with all her stuff. She can't even hear her to see it, receive it. But what does Mary do? And the physical posture is incredibly important. Because Mary, who was found sitting at the feet of Jesus, what does she do when she sees Jesus in the crisis of her brother? She runs to Jesus and says she fell again at his feet. The posture she has absorbed, and she's coming to absorb again who he is. She doesn't understand. She just has the same questions. But what a different spirit she's coming because she understands who he is. So when she says to him, Jesus, had you been here because she knows he's resurrection power, and she understands, but she just still doesn't get the fullness because, remember, she doesn't know resurrection power is on the table, but she knows he's powerful. She knows he's almighty. She's received an impartation. You know, it's like you know God's big, but you don't necessarily get, like, the fullness because you haven't experienced it. But you know, like, something more is available. She comes and she's at his feet. And what does Jesus say? He looks at her and he says, where have you laid him? And the difference between the sisters, one gets a lecture, but one gets her brother. Why is this so important? Because in this season of contradiction, of waiting, of delays, friends, we must find ourselves reacquainted with the feet of Jesus. I heard over this house, the reason I'm bringing this word is I heard the Lord say this house is going to find themselves in extended times at the feet of Jesus. You're going to have moments where you can actually feel Jesus walk in the room and you're going to be on your faces at his feet. And it is at his feet where there will be an impartation. And you need every impartation for it will teach you how to steward what's right around the corner. The Lord says this is a house that was created for intimacy. This is a house that was created for encounter. I believe even if you don't call this your home church, I believe this message is for you. I believe this is a message we are called to apply to our lives in this hour. It is the only place you will guard yourself against offense. In a world, in a church, in a culture that is so offended, the only way we can stay sweet in the spirit in the places of waiting is to be at his feet. If there's anyone from the worship team available, go ahead and come on up. If not, that's okay. But I believe there's a move of God that's going to happen in this city of Bakersfield. I, I really believe that. And here's my husband and I, we love revival. And my husband has studied so much revival. He always shares these stories with me. I'll ask him stuff. I just, I love hearing about what God has done. And he made a statement one time, and it really hit me. He said, revival, all revivals, every single move of God that has ever existed in history can be traced back to an encounter. And the encounter started with an individual. So when God invades an individual life, it's called an encounter. But every revival has begun with an encounter. Here's why I'm saying this. I feel like the encounters that happen here are going to host a move of God out there. The individual encounter is going to have, in a sense, can I say it this way, like a general population impact. I feel like the Lord says, do not underestimate the power of the encounter at his feet in the house. The necessity of waiting at the feet of Jesus in this time. You are no longer in business as usual, friends. Some, something shifted this weekend for you. Thank you, Lord. I just heard the Lord say, open up the altars. I'm here. 
come to my feet. So if you want to just come to his feet, whatever that looks like, if you're not able to, that's okay. You know, there's no legalism here. Jesus can encounter you all over this room. Trust me. But I do feel like there is something at the altar tonight. If you're able to, come to the feet of Jesus. Now, I believe there's an impartation and there's an anointing to absorb the presence of the Lord tonight. What Mary received and what Martha missed, I believe history is trying to teach us how to come into the presence different than how we have in past seasons. And if I can be so bold, some of you are even pull, like feeling pulled, and there's no shame or condemnation, but I, I do want to just simply caution, don't let yourself just be pulled away from the to-dos of home right now. Don't miss even this moment, because it's a Mary Martha moment. Some will be distracted and leave, but some will absorb the presence of God, and we must choose. We always have an invitation to receive and absorb. I just feel like the Lord is in the room right now, and there's an impartation. Ooh, I feel like the Lord's even breaking off a fence in some hearts right now where you've been offended at the delays of God. I get it. I've walked it. I understand it. But the offense is going to fall off your heart tonight. And there's a tenderness for you reconnecting with the Lord tonight that's going to awaken this intimacy between you and Jesus that you've been longing for, but the hindrance has been offense because you haven't understood the delays 